Welcome to the world of hearing aid manufacturing, where time equals money and delays can result in a poor experience for hearing care providers and hearing aid users. I'm Anthea Bott, and I manage a team, a small team of data scientists within GN Hearing. My team are responsible for developing machine learning algorithms from large data sets, bringing value to our hearing care providers, individuals with hearing loss, as well as improving our internal R&D product development processes and our internal manufacturing and operations processes. In this presentation today, I'll talk you through a project where we looked to enhance how we manufacture custom hearing aids with machine learning. I want to place this in the context of a five stage machine learning lifecycle framework that my team commonly employ when we are um, involved in a project from start to monitoring models. So let's kick off. Step one, stage one, just like any research project is where you kick off and you define your business case. What is it that you are investigating? What are the problems that you want to solve? One of the learnings that we had um, from this particular project is that actually as you get deeper into the project, your business case and business value might shift as you learn and uncover more um, throughout this process. It's an extremely important conversation to have when you kick off because it allows you to um, uh, set certain benchmarks that you might want to hit um, as you go through and that helps you know, put a, a time element on your projects as well. So here are a list of um, common questions that we will ask as we are starting to define the business case. Of course, who should be involved <clears throat> both internally um, within the team, but also different subject matter experts that we might, might need to bring in. Of course, what is the project scope? Importantly, uh, um, points five, do we even need machine learning to solve this problem? And why this was important in this particular project was because we're working with operations and there could be some process changes um, that we might need to factor in as well as or instead of machine learning. Finally, um, with the introduction of the EU AI Act, we also <clears throat> have conversations around the regulatory requirements that we need to consider. Are these algorithms that are considered high risk? Are these algorithms that are considered unacceptable risk? It's important for us to cover off these questions before we start um, really delving into um, the the project too much. So in the context of this custom manufacturing world, which might be unfamiliar to some of you, here I've shown um, still a, a rather simplified version of some of the steps that um, we go through when we manufacture um, a hearing aid, a custom hearing aid, the in the ear style. Um, product. So once we at GN receive this product, there are many steps um, that the that transpire, and this leads to opportunities for improvement. In this specific project that I'm referring to, my team were involved in this final um, step inspection um, and testing. This is where we make sure that the hearing aid that we have assembled then meets our regulatory requirements, passes all of our specific um, testing 
and then can be sent on to the customer. So um, as we were onboarding to this, um, this new project and, and learning about this area, we came to um, our, our kind of final project scope, which is we wanted to reduce the lead time on manufacturing of custom hearing aids. And we wanted to do this by classifying failure reasons on what we call DSA tests. DSA stands for Digital Signal Analysis. It is the suite of electroacoustic tests that we perform on the hearing aid before we ship it. And how we got to that point was actually through our stage two, our data exploration stage. Because my team, uh, we are often involved in, in really diverse projects, the, um, we can't be experts in everything. So this data exploration stage was really important uh, for us to understand um, the problem that we're working with, um, understanding, you know, the different distributions and, and if this is something that we can solve with um, machine learning. Here, what I'm showing is one of the key findings that came out of this data exploration stage. What we have here is uh, um, four graphs. The top two graphs show the output of one of the tests that is performed during this DSA suite of tests. And what you can see along the x-axis is um, the frequency and on the y-axis is intensity in dB SPL. And the top two graphs are devices that have passed this test. So here we see this really nice smooth curve um, compared to the two graphs below, which you can very clearly see is a jagged um, um, a jagged looking shape on the graph. What we learned through this data exploration phase was this pattern for the bottom two graphs actually indicated that the device was failing because of a specific reason called feedback. What we also learned through the data exploration phase was that this reason needs the device to typically be a little bit reworked before it will pass the test, before we can then send it on to the customer. So this was our starting point to say, this is a problem that we can see. Now we want to address this through machine learning. One of the other benefits of um, having this um, visual inspection is that it gives you a little bit of a little bit more confidence when you're going to build a model if you can actually as a human see a difference between a pass and a fail it's more likely that your model is also going to be able to detect this so on to our third stage, we have our problem that we've defined. We want to identify um, devices that fail because of feedback compared to those that don't. And now we go into developing our, um, our machine learning um, algorithm. So we have a, a, a pretty um, simple classification. Is it feedback, yes or no, that we're trying to predict on. In my team, we, um, we utilize the Microsoft Azure suites, the ML um, Studio, and this allows us to place our data um, in um, the Microsoft service, and then it can run through a number of different algorithms. It's, it's really quite a fantastic tool that we have access to. So this is the output of the final model that we moved um, into production. You can see it has a, 
um, a, a fairly good results. One, of course, is being our feedback and zero is being no feedback. I think the accuracy is around 92%. Uh, we also have really nice precision and recall rates as well. But one of the um, novel areas to come out of this model development stage and in this specific project is we actually got to validate this model with the ground truth before we moved it into production. So we developed a web service that we could then um, test with our team in operations in our manufacturing site. They could scan a serial number, they could get the prediction and they could tell us if the model was performing um, accurately by actually then listening into the hearing instrument and seeing if they could um, hear and detect feedback. Um, so this was a really powerful step that we could um, employ during our model development life cycle and gave us a lot of confidence moving forward to the um, deployment stage. So we've gone through all this work, we've set the business case, we've explored the data, we have a model that we're comfortable with. And for me, this is where the fun really starts. Now we're shifting gears from development to deployment. Now we're trying to ask ourselves questions, both from a technical perspective, how are we going to deploy this? What are our options? How are we going to monitor this? But also, who is going to use it? How are we going to get them to use it? So what I really, really want to highlight here um, is that you can have the best performing model. You can have all the technical um, requirements in place. You can have all the monitoring systems that you uh, need to make sure that your data is not drifting and um, that your API calls are, are, are working as, as you need. But do not forget the purpose of why you're doing this. You also have to consider the business value how can you monitor? Is your model actually bringing value to the company that you initially set out um, to achieve? Are you reducing lead time? Who is going to be responsible for monitoring this? What can we automate? And then finally, who is going to use it? Because again, you have to think about how can we integrate this into a system that people can easily use so they get the intended value that we have um, invested into this model. It's not um, something that people will automatically know how to use. Do they need some training? Do we need to update our existing process instructions? One of the strengths that we had from this project was that um, we knew we were going to integrate this into our manufacturing sites. So we identified early on who would be our local champions to help drive this to make sure that the, um, the value of the model was actually being um, received um, at the end and as intended. So um, that brings us to our, our final stage, which is our model monitoring. And here what I'm showing is after we went through that whole process, setting up the technical structure, we had many conversations with our local experts. We came to this conclusion that we would integrate this really, really simple pop up into the current existing system that would say, for a device that had failed this test, is the device because failure reason because of feedback? If it is, then please do not retest the device until it has been reworked. 
How we got to this point was again because of that early data exploration where we identified that these devices that fail because of feedback, actually they do not pass testing until they are reworked. So I think it's so important that you um, have a deployment plan and then you have the monitoring in place. I mean, you have spent so much time and resources building this model, getting it ready to go into production. You really are doing yourself a disservice if you um, don't have these monitoring systems in place because then you really are, once you do have them in place, then you can really start to understand how do you operationalize your model so that it is actually bringing business value. So that brings me to the, the end of my presentation and I, I want to thank Simone and the organizing committee of the conference for inviting me to give this uh, presentation today. I think it's really amazing all the diversity in um, topics that are being covered. If you want to reach out to me to um, hear more about this project and to talk through more of the learnings, my details are, are on the slide and I think we have some time to um, catch up now as well. Thank you.